Touchscreens on PCs are not a new development. There's been touchscreen support built into Windows ever since the tablet version of XP was released back in 2002. And their use picked up pace with the release of Windows 8 and its awful tile interface, and devices like this HP laptop from 2012, which now runs Ubuntu Mate and is actually usable. Before that, there were of course other touchscreen devices like the HP Jornada Palm Top range running Windows CE, and the lovable, if slightly ahead of its time, Apple Newton. But what if I told you that touchscreen devices were available back in the MS-DOS days? Well, they were, and there's one on the bench behind me. Should we go and take a look? Come on. So this is the HP 150 from 1983. It was released in response to IBM's original 5150 PC and sought to differentiate itself from various other IBM clones on the market by offering something that no other commercially available microcomputer had offered to this point. There's no trickery here. I'm actually controlling this machine using my finger. How cool is that? We'll get to how this works in a minute, but before we do, let's talk a little more about this machine specifications and what makes it a truly awesome piece of tech nostalgia. So if you'd never laid eyes on one of these before, you'd probably make the same assumption that I did, that this is the computer and this is the monitor. But actually, much like the Apple Macintosh that will come out a year later, the computer is held inside the monitor itself. And actually, if I pick this up and turn it around, You can see all of the I.O. on the back here. This is actually just the disk drive unit. Our drive unit here is model 9122 and has two 3.5 inch floppy drives which use 720 kilobyte disks. But other units were available for the HP 150, including some models which included a fixed hard disk as well. No such luck for us though, we'll be booting solely from floppies it seems. This unit connects to the computer via an HPIB bus, otherwise known as IEEE 488. This is a short-range 8-bit parallel bus developed in the 1960s, which allowed data to be easily fed into this computer's 8088 CPU, which also used an 8-bit bus. If the interface name sounds familiar to you, that's because it's the same interface standard that was used on the Commodore PET. So with the storage unit concisely explained, let's refocus for now on the actual computer. The overall dimensions on this thing are pretty small at roughly 12 inches cube, though it looks larger due to the relatively small cathode tube. That's a 9 inch display provided by Sony, capable of 80 column text mode as well as bitmap graphics at 512 by 390 pixels. Round to the back you've got the power supply section at the top right, with the machine's on-off switch being easily accessible by just reaching around the monitor. Below that you've got the standard AC input as well as an AC output for driving the disk module below. Below that you've got the system board section on this back plane. There's a removable battery clip here and this machine takes standard LR1 batteries to power the real-time clock and preserve other settings. Below that you've got two standard RS-232 ports with 25 pin connectors, with the left one here also being capable of supporting the newer RS-422 standard, which can transmit data at speeds of up to 10 megabits per second. In 1983? You've then got an RJ11 connector for the keyboard, as well as the aforementioned HPIB connector for attaching the disk module or other compatible accessories. Below that you've got two expansion bays which would usually have covers on, though on this example they're sadly missing. The left slot here has a RAM expansion card installed, but these slots could also be used to add additional connectivity options like a parallel port for connecting to a printer. That RAM expansion card was important because this machine only came with 256 kilobytes of memory from the factory, but with this 384 kilobyte module we're up to a full 640k of base memory. If we undo these five screws on the back, we can remove the entire system board, which is actually three boards sandwiched together. The smaller one here looks to be just for the comms port, 
And between the other two there, we have the main system board, including the 8088 processor. Now, history has taught me not to muck about with 40-year-old circuit boards unless I really have to. So I'm not going to dismantle this any further. But if you did want to know more about the system board, then Adrian Black has an excellent video on his channel, which I've linked to below. Connectivity with the display is via this edge connector here, and this also handles the signalling for the touchscreen itself, which I promise we're getting to. Now that's an awful lot of technology crammed into such a small form factor, especially when you consider that the original IBM 5150 was significantly larger than this. But HP weren't done yet because if we flip open this cover, there's space for the user accessible thermal printer. This was a separate user installable option and allowed the user to print out files as you might expect, but also allowed the output to the screen in text mode to be printed continuously on a roll of thermal paper, almost like a log of everything that had been typed or processed on the computer. Obviously, our example doesn't have it, but it was a popular option as it meant you had an entire microcomputer set up in a relatively small footprint. So let's get this thing back together and connected back up to the disk module and keyboard and we'll get it booted up. This example comes with the bundled MS-DOS operating system on a floppy disk here. We just need to insert the disk, turn on the disk module and the computer and wait for it to boot up. This will load up the HP TOS or Terminal Operating System which is based on MS-DOS version 2.11 in this case, but the 150 also shipped with DOS 2.01 or 3.2, depending on which disk module you had. This shell allows you to quickly make changes to the configuration of the machine, enter into pure DOS mode, or quickly access applications that were found on disks in either drive bay. Change the disk in drive B, and touch the button on the screen to reread the disks and it refreshes the available applications on the screen. Interestingly, for an MS-DOS machine, the 150 technically isn't IBM PC compatible. That is to say, you can't just take any MS-DOS program and expect it to work with this machine. That said, we've got a variety of different professional packages that will work with this machine, so we'll see how we get on later. So onto that touch screen, you, you might be wondering how on earth touchscreen might work with a CRT monitor. I mean, modern touchscreens use either a capacitive or resistive layer on top of the actual LCD display. But how would those sorts of technology work when there's no discernible layer on top of the glass of this display? The answer lies, quite literally, in the rather chunky looking bezels surrounding the screen. View it at a slight angle and you immediately notice these holes in the bezel. These contain rows of infrared transmitters and receivers which form a grid on both the X and Y axis. These pass beams of invisible light from side to side and top to bottom and when you interrupt those beams with a finger, or any other implement I suppose, the 150 is able to interpret where the user was intending to touch the screen. In fact, you don't actually have to touch the screen at all in order to register the input. You just need to break the beams in the right position. You can see how this works in more detail if you look at this spare bezel included with this machine. The infrared diodes are in these rows around the edge, and the changes in state are fed into these multiplexer chips, and the outputs sent via this 10-pin connector on the edge back to the system board. Please don't ask me to explain that in any more detail, because I can't. The resolution of the matrix is quite small. You only have 14 rows and 21 columns, meaning you only have a total of 294 touch points on the screen. So the software included has been written in such a way that the on-screen options line up perfectly with the emitters, making the best use of the rather basic touchscreen. So what's this machine actually like to use? Well, the touchscreen is actually surprisingly intuitive considering the basic technology at play here. In terms of the bundled software, there are quite a few different productivity apps included on our disks here, and most have been rewritten in part to take advantage of the touchscreen. A quick look online shows a fair few other packages were also made for the HP 150, including the likes of MS Word, Lotus 123, and even AutoCAD. 
In fact, there was even a version of Windows made exclusively for the HP 150, and it did support some of the touch features. But sadly, it can only be installed to a hard disk, which we don't have, so can't test it. Even without Windows though, there's plenty to keep the 150 in use as a home or office microcomputer back in 1983. And its success was enough to keep HP on the touch input track for a little while longer, with them releasing the HP 152 in 1984, and continuing to sell the original HP 150 as a terminal for their line of microcomputers well after this date. In 1985 though, HP would release the Vectra in a drive to be fully compatible with the IBM PC, and thereafter the HP 150 would be resigned to being a footnote in early microcomputer technology. What a footnote it is though. I'm quite enamoured with it really. What do you think? Thank you for watching this video. If you've enjoyed it, please consider leaving a like, and if you're a fan of this kind of content, you can check out some more of my videos on the screen now, right next to that subscribe button. That said, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Bye bye.